Uh, the sermon title today is The Shepherd of the Sheep, and we're going to be in John chapter 10 and verses 1 through 6. I can tell you, when I started the book of John, uh, now a little over a year ago, I started that at Springs Bible Church before we uh, launched Here's Peak. Um, there were three chapters that I was kind of afraid to preach. That's John 10 and John 15 and John 17. Um, I'm not afraid to preach these because I think I'm going to, you know, be a heretic um, and err theologically, though that's possible. I'm not perfect. Um, and, and I'm not afraid to preach them because of, of the response. But there's passages that hold a very particular weight in Christianity. And John 10 and John 15 and John 17 are some of those passages. Now, some of you may know what a, a Fabergé egg is. Um, if you don't know, yeah, Cherry's like, yeah, I know what that is. Uh, Fabergé eggs are incredibly ornate pieces of decoration. They hold no purpose besides looking pretty. Uh, they don't do anything. They're just pretty. But what you do, uh, my, my great-grandmother on my stepmom's side made Fabergé eggs, and everybody in the family has one. I have one. Amanda has one. Um, they're not our style. We don't put them out. They're in a box somewhere that my children will inherit, will inherit and then they'll keep them in a box somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but she would take ostrich eggs, and they're colored and and, and painted and, and cut in a very precise manner. Um, some that she would cut would uh, have openings in them, and, and she'd put stuff inside, and, and it'd just be left open. And there were some that she would cut in, in such a precise manner that and she would maintain the integrity of, of the shell of the egg, and it became a door. And so they would have a hinged piece on a Fabergé egg that you would open and close the door, and they're on these pedestals, and they're very, again, ornate and gaudy. I think the one I have is black, and there's a, a swan, a black swan inside, and Amanda's is pink, and there's like a little pillow inside for rings or whatever, um, whatever treasure you might want. It, yours has the hinged door, right? These things are incredibly delicate. I mean, you know, I can't crack an egg without pieces of shell falling everywhere, and she would take the time to you know, open these up in such a way that she could drain out everything inside and dry them and, and cut them in a very precise manner and then decorate them uh, with incredible care and attention to detail. They have value because of the effort that was put into them, right? Otherwise, it's just an egg and some paint and beads. Yeah, it's nothing. But the effort that went into them to make them something pretty is why they're valuable. Well, when you handle these, you use v extreme caution and care because it's an egg, right? It, it's something that breaks easily. We don't let our kids grab them and, and run around with them. They don't sit out on a shelf where they could get knocked over. Growing up, my stepmom had some of these in a curio cabinet in our front room, and uh, they were kept inside a curio cabinet so that, you know, uh, myself or my little brothers, when we're running around, we didn't destroy them. But the passage that we're reading today, I approach kind of like a, a Fabergé egg, not because it's delicate, but because it's so valuable. The, the analogy of the good shepherd that Jesus uses in John 10 is really impactful and it holds a lot of power. Now we're going to divide um, this section of, of the, the good shepherd in John 10. Uh, my ESV has the Good Shepherd as the kind of title of at the beginning of chapter 10. And it goes all the way through verse 21. Now, verses 19 through 21 is kind of an, a, an addendum, a response to the, um, from the Jews to Jesus. And verse 6 that we're going to end at today is a break where it says that basically they didn't understand what Jesus was saying in this figure of speech that Jesus used with these people. But Jesus uses this analogy of a shepherd, and, and he breaks it into sections as well, because he says these different things at different times. In the passage we're going to look at today, Jesus doesn't show up in verses 1 through 5. He doesn't say, 
I am whatever. He's working on, on building the framework of, of this analogy. That's what we're going to spend our time in today. And then next week, we're going to get into verses 7 through 10, where we find that Jesus is the door. And then the following week, Resurrection Sunday, it's perf- God's timing is perfect. And I don't even have to leave John for Resurrection Sunday because we get, I am the good shepherd, and he lays down his life for the sheep, and he takes it up again. Uh, in verses 11 through 18, and then again that addendum in 19 through 21. So uh, you have to realize as we work through this that next week when Jesus talks about the door, him being the door of the sheep, it's not the same thing that we're talking about here. He's using the same analogy in different ways as he moves um, through this discourse as he's speaking here. Another really important thing for us to remember here is that there's no chapter and verse divisions in the original manuscripts. So chapter 9 flows right into chapter 10. We don't separate these. We don't divide these arguments. It's part of the same passage of Scripture. Because that provides a lot of context to what's happening in verses 1 through 5. For us to grasp this section or this uh, passage of scripture at all to get the analogy uh, that Christ is working through, we have to understand some background things about what it looks like to be a shepherd. And maybe you've been in the church for a long time and you've heard some of this before, but if you haven't, there's a great difference in first century shepherds or even modern Middle Eastern shepherds and what we do here in America when we have sheep. In America, uh, the shepherds will actually drive the sheep, like cowboys, this cattle drive kind of thing. And you have shepherds that will have flocks big enough that they use helicopters and loudspeakers to push the sheep in a certain direction. They'll use sheepdogs to to corral and bite and and try and get them to go one way. Now, we do this because we're cowboys, right? And uh, you have to corral and push cattle. You drive cattle, but sheep can be led. There's a big difference. But first off, we have to look at some characteristics of sheep. One is that sheep serve a a purpose. They're valuable. There's a reason that first century shepherds spent a lot of time with sheep. And when you think about the patriarchs of Israel, they're all shepherds. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David, right? These are Men that are shepherds that God used in mighty ways, but they're shepherds because the sheep serve a purpose. They're there for milk at times in that culture. We don't do that so much today. Some do uh, here in the States. Um, They serve a purpose for uh, providing meat um, at times, and then most of all, wool, of course, for garments. Second thing to know is that sheep are absolutely helpless. Sheep will not protect themselves. They will run, but they're not very fast. Um, They're not very smart. Uh, Someone was telling me this week as I was discussing this passage that if a shepherd were to be working his way around a ravine, he would have to call his sheep to the far edge of it to follow him there and then call them back to go around the other side. Because if he just walked around the ravine and called them, they just fall into the ravine. Um, They're not very bright. Sheep, in fact, disprove the theory of evolution. Because if it's survival of the fittest, sheep would not have survived. Uh, They need people. Uh, They were, you know, we're all sixth day. um, And so the sixth day of creation, we have animals, we have men. And sheep need men in order to survive. Um, I saw a documentary years ago where a sheep in Australia had wandered off by itself. And apparently it happened to stay uh, away from predators long enough that its wool built up huge around it. And it was this massive ball with these tiny little legs walking around because sheep need to be sheared. But its wool growing up that large, it looked like a mushroom, but its wool growing up that large actually protected it from predators because they would try to bite it and they couldn't get through all the wool. But it was this black, nasty thing that they had to shear. And his legs were injured because of the weight of the wool. Sheep need people. So uh, the evolutionists, I can say, what about sheep? And they would just go, well, 
I don't get that one. Um, Because if you know sheep, it doesn't work. Uh, Another thing to know is that sheep frighten very easily. They will flee quickly. And we'll get to that more later as we work through this passage. Uh, We've kind of already said that sheep will die if, if left alone. They need provision. They need to be led from place to place. And a final thing to know about sheep is that they are uh, the scriptures often compare men to sheep. So as soon as you start feeling good and prideful about yourself and thinking you're okay, go online and watch some videos of sheep. And you'll be like, well, if that's how God refers to us, and you know, David embraces that in Psalm 23, but you look at Isaiah 53 or this passage here in John 10 with Jesus, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work out well for the sheep if they don't have a shepherd. They're not smart. Um, They're not independent. They need people. They need a shepherd. So what about shepherds? Shepherds had to love their sheep. Now, I I like animals. You know, Tom mentioned in Sunday school, he's got dogs and cats and and he likes animals. Um, There's one cat on our land now that we've been living at for a week. Uh, That's okay. And he will follow you everywhere and ask to be picked up. Um, His name is Sunshine. I didn't name him. Why there's a male cat named Sunshine, I don't know. Uh, I've called him or her about a million times. Um, but I love dogs. Uh, I went this morning and let the chickens out. I like chickens, right? Animals are great. Um, but there's a special relationship that happens between a person and, a, and an animal they spend a lot of time with. Uh, I have not spent much time with these new cats or the chickens. I don't plan on spending much time with the cats or the chickens. But I'm a dog person, and my dog I love. When I get home, no one is happier to see me than Sophie. And my wife and children love me, I know. But no one is happier to see me than my dog, Sophie. She runs up, and she wants to be pet, and she'll jump up on me, and she loves to be cuddled and to be right next to you on the couch or whatever. Um, We have a special relationship with animals, a bond builds. A shepherd a first century shepherd or a modern day Middle Eastern shepherd has to have this kind of relationship with his sheep. You have to know them because sheep, as we said, as I said at the very beginning, are led in the Middle East or in the first century. Um, They, the shepherd would call them as Jesus uh, expresses here, and they follow the voice of their shepherd. Now, if you don't know that voice, if you haven't spent time with them, you can't call them. It won't matter. When I was looking this up, I saw, or researching this passage, I saw a video of a a young girl that wanted to find out if the, uh, if sheep would really flee at the voice of a stranger, but come to the voice of a shepherd. I don't know where this video takes place, but there was a very aged man with the shepherd's crook, and there's modern basketball courts in the background, so maybe Israel somewhere, I don't know. Um, But uh, these two young girls come up and they're trying to call the sheep and they ask them, hey, can we call to your sheep and see if they will come to us? And they couldn't get within 15, 20 feet of the sheep. They would just run away. And they said, okay, so they do flee at the voice of the stranger. Well, will they come when the shepherd calls them? And they say, oh, well, will you come? Will you call them to see if they come? And they back up a little bit and the shepherd calls and, and one of the sheep is very timidly approaching the shepherd, and he turns around and he goes, you're too close. And they back up even further, and then the sheep just come freely to the shepherd when he calls them. And there's no hesitance because they know the shepherd, right? The shepherd's been out there with them. He's spent time with them. He's uh, met their needs. The shepherd loves his sheep. The shepherd does discipline the sheep. Right? When they stray, they have to take measures to, to bring them back. The shepherd gets between his sheep and harm. We think of David killing lions and bears to protect his sheep. David doesn't do that by, you know, the bears over on the other side of the flock and he grabs a sling and throws a rock, you know, a few hundred yards and hits a sheep or hits a bear to protect his sheep. Might hit a sheep early on. He's got to practice more. But he gets between the sheep and the danger. The shepherd does know his sheep. You have to spend time with something to know it better. And 
you can picture, you know, you might start naming sheep, but when you get a bunch, you might be like, hey, uh, long ears or uh, stubby nose or spots or whatever. I had a great uncle uh, that I don't know if he couldn't remember my name or what, but he called me Rusty because I'm covered in freckles. And he said, those were my rust spots. Um, but you, you imagine the shepherd's out there and he spends good time with the sheep. He knows them by name, as we see here uh, in chapter 10, as when, when we'll read it. Uh, David Gordon wrote a book I read recently. He said, uh, someone that really reads and that wants to get the most out of something will read three to five books on a single topic to have an introduction to it. Right? We like to say, oh, I watched a two-minute YouTube video, and now I know everything there is to know about whatever. But you have to spend time with something to really, truly know it. The shepherd has to move the sheep along at an appropriate pace. This is really important as well, because if you have uh, a, a mother uh, sheep, that's uh, you that's with, with child that has a, a lamb following it or a lamb um, still inside of it, if you have elderly sheep, you try and drive them or you take them too far from a water source, you're going to kill them. So they have to um, move them on at an appropriate pace to know the sheep well enough to do that. The shepherd also provides for the sheep. We see in Psalm 23, he leads them to green pastures. He stays near water sources. These are all important things for the shepherd to do. So the first century shepherd, the shepherd in Israel today, would go out and sleep with the sheep and spend time with the sheep and and know the sheep, be with them often. Well, the other thing that Jesus mentions here, he has the sheep, the shepherd, and then the sheepfold. Now, a sheepfold is a pen that the sheep would be placed in. Sometimes this was done with sticks. In the Middle East, it was often done with rocks up against a cave, if you could. And you would bring your sheep into the fold at night. So sometimes you could sleep in your own bed. And then you would have a, either, uh, there would be a group of shepherds that would all keep their sheep in the same fold. And they would either take a rotation where uh, they would stay in the gate um, and take turns there. Or they would hire an under shepherd to go and stand in the gate and make sure that no one else came through. There was only one entrance to the sheepfold. Because you don't want mass confusion. You don't want people able to steal the sheep or go in other ways. There's one entrance. Uh, There were often briars or thistles they would place around the top of these rock walls to help keep thieves out. Um, Again, the gatekeepers in the door. And here in particular, this idea that there's multiple flocks in uh, one sheepfold is important for us. So now we've kind of searched that out a little bit. Uh, There's a great book by uh, Philip Keller, called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. I would commend it to you. It's a really good book that walks through. Um, he, he was a shepherd in Africa, uh, and then he wrote his view of Psalm 23 based on his experience as a shepherd, and it's really good. But uh, if you would, please stand with me. We'll read John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll get uh, into this passage. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he, do, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Please be seated. Father, we thank you that as we'll see in a couple weeks, Lord, that Jesus is the the good shepherd, that as we'll see next week, that Jesus is the, the door. But Lord, there's words of caution for us here today. There's joy that we can uh, find here in this passage today. Lord, I pray you minister to our hearts as we attempt to do so. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to kind of do what we normally do in this passage where we walk through verse by verse, but we're going to step outside of it a little bit and pull some comparisons based on what Jesus is doing here. Because what he's doing is he's separating this idea of the thief and robber and the true shepherd. He's comparing these things as we walk through. Now, just back in chapter 9 and verse 40, uh, we know that Pharisees were listening to Jesus speak and and walk through as he, he spoke or as he uh, talked with the man who, had, who he had healed, 
but had been cast out of the synagogue. So let's jump back to verse 39. He says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. The Pharisees hear, hear this, and then they say, Are we also blind? In verse 40. Verse 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Last week we talked about the fact that this is the uh, sh- the Pharisees trying to make their own way to God. They're trying to have their own access, their own approach to him besides Jesus. And it doesn't work. And because they say we can get to God some way besides Jesus, Jesus tells them your guilt remains because you're not good enough. You're not righteous enough. You don't know enough to make this happen. So that context is really important as we get into, into chapter 10. And he says, truly, truly, that's how he starts this verse. And that, you know, I think the King James would say, verily, verily, uh, this is a a really impactful thing. Jesus is saying, pay attention to what I'm saying. This is incredibly important. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. So we need to establish here as we approach this analogy, what is the sheepfold? Now, Later, the sheepfold, we have the Jesus is the door, and by that door you go in and out. We get this right relationship with God. But here, the one that enters by the, the one that doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door, the sheepfold is the nation of Israel. So the people of Israel are all encased in the sheepfold right now. And Jesus says, that there's a shepherd of the sheep that's going to access through the door, but then there's thieves and robbers. Well, these are the men that he just told, hey, you're blind, back at the end of chapter 9. These are the Pharisees, the, one that, the ones that thought that they could get to God another way. The Pharisees missed the entire point of the law, right? The law is there to demonstrate your sin, to show you that you're deficient, The Pharisees said, oh, the law is here and the rules that we add to the law so that we can be good enough, that we can measure up. But what they miss is that if you've messed up in one point of the law, you're guilty of all. The uh, the sheepfold here is the nation of Israel, and the shepherd is the one that goes in and calls them out. So, uh, the thieves and the robbers of the Pharisees, the shepherd in this is Jesus, though he doesn't name himself that yet. Um, but let's compare the shepherd versus the robbers. A few points of comparison here. First, the shepherd goes through the door while the robber goes over the wall. So Jesus is approaching the door in a correct fashion. He's approaching this nation of Israel, the people of Israel, by a correct fashion, and that he's saying, We have to go through God. We have to have his righteousness. Significant to note here that he's later going to call them out by name that not everyone in the nation of Israel was saved. Not everyone was a true child of God. Jesus calls out those that are his by name. Everyone's name that is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in Revelation 13, 8. If you wonder how do we know that the sheepfold is Israel, how, how come this isn't broader. Well, he explains that later um, in in the chapter. In verse 16, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. That's the inclusion of the Gentiles expanding past the nation of Israel here uh, later. We'll get to that again in a couple weeks. So the, um, sorry, I lost my spot. The shepherd goes through the door while the robber goes over the wall. The robber has to go over the wall because he doesn't have any real access, and there's a gatekeeper that's going to keep him out. Now, in this analogy, we would say in verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens. Who is that gatekeeper? I don't know. Some commentators would say it was God, um, but whatever it looks like, we don't have to make the analogy perfectly fit everything. Um, But the shepherd is the only one who can go through the door correctly, which is telling us here, Jesus is saying the Pharisees are trying to get to God um, or to bring people or to uh, establish people as the people of God in an incorrect fashion. Second point of comparison is that the door is open to the shepherd, but closed to the robber. 
Imagine being the spiritual leaders of Israel and being told that you are nothing besides a thief and a robber. These words basically mean the same thing. Robber is also translated elsewhere as insurrectionist. Um, But you are a thief and a robber. You're a lowlife. They didn't come through the real door. And and again, this is where the analogy changes around uh, with the nation of Israel being in the sheepfold, but then next week, Jesus being the door. And we can't confuse these two right now because it becomes somewhat muddled later. But you can't get to a right, right relationship with God by climbing over the wall. There's only one means of entrance. The shepherd calls the sheep by name, but the robber does not know them. We talked earlier about how the shepherd has to be intimately acquainted with the sheep because he has spent time with them and knows them well. He's mended wounds. He's gone after them when they've strayed. He knows these sheep. Jesus says that the shepherd calls out his sheep by name. It's a a very specific knowing of these animals. He leads them out. This is a great comfort to us as believers because God knows us, right? The shepherd knows which of his sheep will only eat fine grass and which of his sheep will eat absolutely anything. He knows which one has a limp and can't keep up. The shepherd knows the sheep that won't listen and the one that comes the second he is called. It's like knowing your children, right? My children have very distinct personalities. They're very different people. Similar in some ways, but very different in others. Calvin's the one who's analytical and will, you know, go after a situation and make sure that he's considering the various vantage points and try and nuance his way to get the best of a situation. Aiden will just run at it. And, you know, he's the one that was flying off the top of the couch and uh, to jump on me when I'm laying on the floor. Very different children. Um, Very different sheep. He knows who's slow and who's fast. For us, we look at this and say that the shepherd calls them out by name and leads them. God knows you, believer. He knows the hairs on your head. And some of us have fewer hairs than others. That's okay. I made fun of my dad when he started losing his hair when he was like 26. Um, I lasted longer than him. Um, But he knows the number of hairs on your head, whether you have a lot or a little. He knows if you're the person that will charge hard into a situation and have to clean up the mess afterwards, or if you're the one that's more slow and analytical with it. He paid a a steep price for you, and he will not let you go. He's going to guard you with all of his might, no matter what the enemy does to try and pull you away, because he knows you intimately. There's times when you feel like you're all alone and God isn't there, and you don't have this great shepherd that that watches over you. That's on your side, not on his. When I feel far from God, I can know because I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior that he is never far from me. You can't get away. Satan can't pull you away because it's the God who is all-powerful that controls all things that maintains your salvation. And that same God is the one that knows you, cares for you. The shepherd brings out all of his sheep but the robber wouldn't know which sheep to call out. You have multiple sheep in the sheepfold. And again, this is the nation of Israel here. And Jesus says that the the shepherd goes up and calls out all those that are his, these believers from the nation of Israel. In like manner, the robber would go over the wall and he might end up with an assortment of sheep from different people because he has no idea which sheep are which. He couldn't tell that the one with the long, uh, l- the long nose but the short left ear is his. He couldn't, uh, if he calls to them, they won't know his name. That's uh, one of the next points here. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd, but not the voice of the robber. Just as the shepherd knows the sheep because he spends time with him, the sheep know the shepherd because he has spent time with them. They know his voice. They they care, for, uh, they care for the shepherd and that they, they have an affection and a reliance on the shepherd. You can imagine a sheep is, gives birth and there's a young lamb there. And the lamb doesn't know the shepherd's voice yet, but it's relying on its mother. But it follows the mother around and the shepherd has that span of time from the birth of the sheep to, to when it's going to be weaned from its mother to 
get to know it and to get the sheep to follow after him. The voice of the robber, they will flee. Some of us here kind of fail when we claim to know Christ because we haven't spent enough time with him. We haven't spent enough time in his word and to listen to him. We'll get to that more here in a moment and the responsibility of the sheep. The sheep follow the shepherd as he leads him, but they flee after the robber. Again, this goes back to the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd is there and he cares for the sheep. He knows them intimately. The robber just goes over the wall to try to pull whatever he can. Now, both the shepherd and the robber are attempting to glean something from the sheep, right? The shepherd doesn't, you know, in America, we're uh, in the Western world, we're into pets. Um, much of the rest of the world doesn't do pets because you need food. Um, in Indonesia, there's lots of dogs running around, but I've never, I never saw anyone that had a pet dog. Uh, that's a very um, Western kind of concept. concept. Uh, our dog, Sophie, we have her because we enjoy having a dog. We bought our property from Jim and Bev King, who were um, uh, members of this church. And Bev had lots of animals just for enjoyment. Uh, we've inherited some of those animals that were just for enjoyment. The chickens I get, chickens lay eggs. Four cats that are kind of barn cats, but kind of not. They really just lived in a room. Um, we have let them out, and they now roam the property because cats need to take care of mice. That's the purpose of cats, in my view. Um, there's two rabbits that live with our chickens, not in the coop, but in a hole under. I have no idea why we have rabbits. Um, we feed them. I dumped food in front of their hole this morning, but they just run away from you. Our kids have caught them a couple of times and been able to pet them and hold them. Uh, but the rabbits serve no purpose. They're both males, so they're not going to breed. I can't get meat from them. Uh, I, if I took both of their lives, I could have one meal and maybe a glove for one hand. Um, but in the West, we like animals for no purpose, right? We like animals that we can have just because we enjoy animals. The shepherd did not have sheep and spend his entire life investing in sheep because he enjoyed them. He had them for the purpose, that purpose that we said at the beginning, the, the wool, the meat, the milk, um, that the shepherd would glean from this. He's there for a reason, but he still loves the sheep. Now, the robber is there for a reason, and he's just trying to take advantage of the sheep. There's no love. There's no care. So we then have responsibility as sheep to do a few things. <clears throat> One is to hear the voice of the shepherd. Your shepherd beckons you to hear from him. Right, you picture, again, this little lamb, and it's following its mother for a while, but the shepherd comes up and he speaks tenderly to the lamb, and he wants the lamb to spend time with them, and he's going to maybe hold him and carry him at times, or he's going to bind his wounds if there's an injury. He's going to lead him into green pastures, and the, the sheep is going to learn to trust the shepherd by the time that he spends with the shepherd. How much time do you spend with your shepherd, believer. You have all the words that the shepherd wants you to know right here, right? It, it's all available to you to hear the voice of the shepherd, to know who to follow, to know who to spend time with. It's all right here, but so often we neglect it. We choose a million different things. We give 15 minutes of our morning to this and then hours the rest of the day to whatever else. We need to hear the voice of the shepherd. He has spoken. It's all right here. A long time ago, there was a, a, a I don't know, it was a sermon clip that uh, I think from uh, Pastor John Piper. And he said, the spirit spoke to me this morning. God himself spoke to me. And I sat there. And I listened, and he told me of his love for me and his care for me and, and what he wants me to do. And, and, and he told me uh, of the sacrifice that Jesus made on my behalf and how he treasures me as one of his children. And then I turned the page, and he told me even more. Right? This is the word of God for you, and this is all that we have for now. 
It has been concluded here, but you could never search the depths of this. And sometimes we think, oh, I've got to be a Bible scholar to get to the bottom of this. Actually, again, there was John Piper speaking at a pastor's conference, and he was telling the pastors, some of you are great scholars in Greek and Hebrew, and that's great. And you can gain all sorts of insights because you know these languages well. And some of you don't know Greek and Hebrew, and you could never exhaust the treasures that are in your English Bible. You spent your entire life on this, you'd never get to the bottom of it. Folks, just go to the Word and hear from your shepherd because he cares for you. He's leading you to greener pastures. He's leading you to still water. And does that always mean your circumstances are going to change? No. But the shepherd that loves you and cares for you, that will guide you through those circumstances, that will speak to you and lead you around the ravine so that you don't fall into it, he's calling to you. Cling to his word. We have a responsibility to hear the shepherd. We also have a responsibility to follow the shepherd. Again, in verse 3, he says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. When the shepherd calls you, follow him. There is lots of things that we are told in the scriptures that God has done for us. The, the indicative, right? The, the things that uh, Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And these are incredibly important because your salvation, your uh, holiness, your sanctification, your walk with God, it's not up to you. If it was up to you, you would lose your salvation and go wayward and end up far worse than you were in the beginning. It's not possible for you to, for you to lose your salvation because it's, it's not up to you. So I'm not saying that. But you would, not, uh, you would not follow after God were it up to you. He maintains you. But there are also imperative commands in the scriptures. There are things that God has told us to do, commands that he gives us to follow. That's why I can, Romans 12, 1, he tells us to submit our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Because of all the, all the theology that's, that Paul explains in verses 1 through 11, or sorry, chapters 1 through 11, he tells you how to live in chapters 12 through 16. There's a responsibility for you to follow. Read his word, obey his word. You don't know better than God what will bring you joy. And you don't know better than God what will work out best for you. We see this with our children often where a child will say, oh, I'm going to do it this way. I remember, I think it was probably 10 years old or so, I was sweeping the back porch and I had really bad allergies as a kid. But I wanted to do this quickly and to move the dirt as far as I could, as fast as I could. And so I'm sweeping really aggressively and all this dust is getting kicked up in the air and I'm sneezing while I do it, but I don't want to just get the job done. And my grandmother comes up to me and she says, you know, if you kept that broom on the ground and you didn't fling it like that at the end, you wouldn't sneeze as much. But of course I knew better. So I just keep flinging dirt. I said, okay, thanks. And just keep at it because I want to get this job done. And of course, as you throw this up in the air, dirt's just settling right back down where you just swept. Um, but I thought I knew a better way. And you know what? Every time I sleep, I think of my grandmother telling me, don't fling it up in the air like that. Just keep it on the ground. You don't know a better way than God, folks. He made you. You know, my grandmother had been around longer than me. God's been around far longer than any of us because he is eternal. Follow the shepherd. Listen to him. Obey the commands that he gives you. Make the aim of your life going after him. There's nothing more valuable than going after Jesus. He's called you out by name. He knows you intimately. He loves you. He cares for you. He calls out all that are his. So in case you think you're getting left behind, no. All that are his, he calls out. He calls out. In verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, they follow him. You will not be left behind. But he's called you, and now your job is to follow after him. The Bible says that those that, he, that, those that the Lord loves, he chastens. Uh, follow him. The chastening isn't very pleasant. 
So we're to hear the shepherd, we're to follow the shepherd. We're also to flee the stranger. There are many, many false teachers out there. And if you don't know the voice of the shepherd, you're not going to be able to distinguish it from the voice of the false teacher. Because there's a lot of people that get pretty close. And, and you think they sound pretty much the same, but there's something wrong. The only way to know what's right is to spend time in God's word, to spend time with him. Trust your under shepherds. God has set pastors over you in the church. Pastor Tom, myself, Pastor Kurt, who's traveling today. God's given people to help that we would know the word well and help guide. And, and some of you do great jobs at answering questions. And, and some people, you know, there's guys I went to Bible college with, and they'll post on Facebook these pastors that they follow. And, oh, look what this guy said. And I would never listen to to these false teachers, but they get excited about them because they don't know the word of God well enough. We have to know his voice. But be careful about false teachers and don't give them an inch. Sometimes in the name of, of love, we think, hey, we should really listen to what they have to say and then we'll kind of maybe approach around and be gentle here. Was Jesus gentle with the Pharisees? He tells them that you're blind and then you're thieves and robbers. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He calls them a, a brood of vipers, right? Or John the Baptist calls them a brood of vipers. There's nothing good that Jesus has to say about these false teachers. Don't give them an inch in your life. If there's plenty of good gospel preaching, faithful biblical preachers out there today, don't listen to guys that are wrong, right? Don't take someone that says, oh, well, he's, you know, really good about this part. But now uh, we get into a, a little bit of a, not a conundrum, but some, a place for discernment here where there's people that we disagree with on certain points because you're not going to disagree with everyone anywhere probably, right? Uh, the classic example everyone always names is R.C. Sproul. I love his preaching. Uh, I read lots of his books, but I wouldn't baptize babies and R.C. baptized babies. Um, Dr. John MacArthur is probably a lot closer to what many of us in here would hold to. Uh, Dr. John Piper has been one of the great influences in my life. His book, Desiring God, is one of the most impactful books I've ever read, but he's also charismatic, and I disagree with him in other areas too. So uh, we're talking orthodoxy here. Don't get me wrong. Um, if you think someone sounds really good in some areas, but they deny that Jesus is the only way to heaven, just denounce it and leave it. And if they say, oh yes, Jesus died for your sins, but we're going to add other things to the gospel, denounce it and leave it. Don't tolerate it. We have a responsibility to hear the shepherd. We have a responsibility to follow the shepherd. And we have a responsibility to flee the false teacher. But we've hit a couple points in this passage around this, but you need to know, believer, that there is great joy in following after the shepherd. The fact that the shepherd does know you by name, that God knows you by name. In verse, or, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from, depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those that are his. This isn't part of an, an analogy that Jesus is using that doesn't carry through. He knows his sheep. God knows you. And God does lead you now. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, we hear from David, right? Go read Psalm 23 and see of the Father's care for you. There's joy in being intimately known by the Father. There's joy in, there's joy in being led by the Father. You can take great joy in the fact that you can know the voice of the shepherd. You know, Tom mentioned at the end of Sunday school that for most of Christian history and uh, most of, you know, Christianity started um, after Christ, but even most of those that would have biblically followed after God, they didn't have this. They didn't have canonized scripture. They didn't have a book they could hold in their hands. 
Um, I read recently that Acts, if it was written out on a single scroll, would have been about 23 feet long. It's not easy to carry the scriptures with you, and you wouldn't have had all of them because they would have been copied by hand, and almost everyone had none of them, right? Most people didn't have anything they could read uh, from the Word of God. They went to the synagogue, and they heard the scriptures read there. So you couldn't go and and pick your favorite thing that you wanted to read, or you couldn't go and reference a passage and research it like that. You had to go ask teachers. We have the Word of God in our hands. And as an American, you probably have a lot of these in your home. And if you don't have, or an American Christian anyway, and if you don't have one of these, you can just open up your smartphone and gain access to pretty much every English translation and most foreign translations that have ever been done. We have incredible access to the Word of God. He has spoken to you. All of it. Right? When I talked at the beginning about passages that are really significant and that we uh, value highly in Christianity, I don't say that to diminish anything else. There's just passages that we hold dear. I would call Romans 8 the the crown jewel of the New Testament. If there's one passage that you're going to get in the New Testament, go read Romans 8 because it lays it all out for us, right? It's this treasure for believers that what the law couldn't do, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, right? There's passages that are particularly impactful. I don't expect to get the same amount of information, the same, or not information, but the same amount of application from 1 Chronicles as I'm going to get from John 10. It's all valuable, but there's passages that have particular impact. But you have the Word of God. You have what He's spoken directly to you, and you have what you need for every circumstance in life, not even in the Bible, but in the gospel. That's what he says, uh, Peter says in 2 Peter 1, he says that he's given us all things pertaining to life and and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you to his own glory and excellence. The knowledge of him who has called you to his own glory and excellence is the gospel, right? If you know Jesus, you have everything you need pertaining to life and godliness. He's provided it all for you. But why stop at just the basics of the gospel when that's glorious And God has revealed so much to us in his word. We're like sheep that, you know, God leads us to this green pasture. And there's this abundant grass that we could go to over and over again. It would never end and you could never exhaust it. And yet we go after whatever else. We're eating eating brambles and, you know, uh, tumbleweeds that are stuck in the side of the field on, on the fence. Why go after, after those other things when he's provided us such wealth here? Finally, the shepherd knows you by name. The shepherd leads you. You can know the voice of the shepherd. But as we said already, the shepherd brings out all of his sheep. Maybe you're in a hard circumstance. Maybe life isn't super easy right now and you feel like you're forgotten. Maybe relationships are broken or you've lost somebody. Maybe finances aren't meeting up. Maybe you just look at the world around us and it's depressing. He calls out all of his sheep. He's not going to leave any of you because he loves you. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I love my dog. I'm excited to see Sophie because she's excited to see me and she's fun. She's a good dog. She's really cute. But the love of God for his sheep, his people, is exponentially greater. Because if I had to choose between my dog and any one of my children, the dog's gone. Right? I know some of you don't have children, you're like, I like dogs better. Um, there, there's, there's kids that are difficult, I will grant that, right? Um, but they're my children. And they're created in the image of God. In fact, if there is any human being and it's them or my dog, the dog has to go. Why? Because the human being is image. You have intrinsic value because you're created in the likeness of God. You have 
you have great value because God made you like himself. That's a really important thing for us because you look at the world around you and you're tempted to denigrate people or, you know, we can disagree with policies or whatever, but these are still people that are made in the image of God. No matter how great the sin is, they're made in the image of God and because of that, they hold great value. I told our guys um, yesterday, I think it was, at the 222 leadership uh, session we had, I was at Shepherd's Conference uh, a couple weeks ago, and Paul Washer was speaking, and, and he, he said near the beginning of, of his sermon that you're really excited to get to heaven and to see Jesus, but he's going to be even more excited to see you. Because you're his sheep, made in his image. You want to know how much God loves you? He gave his body and his blood that he might bring you to himself. He's not going to leave you behind. And in those hard circumstances, when you say, I think God is against me. Think about what we did today. The body was broken and the blood was shed for you. He loves you, believer. He cares for you, and he's your good shepherd. He's going to bring you out. He's going to bring you along. And what happens when we get in these dark moments, and it's hard, sometimes it's really hard. The problem is, is that we're not looking at our great shepherd. We're looking at the circumstances around us. You're, you're looking at the darkness, and, and you're looking at the ground in front of you that isn't fertile. You're you're looking at the robber that's trying to come and take you away or the wolf or the bear. The lion that's there to come after you. What you have to do is look to the shepherd because when you look to the shepherd, that's where your hope is because he's going to get between you and the bear. He's going to lead you into to greener pastures. And again, maybe your circumstances don't change, but the God who, by the way, controls those circumstances, as hard as that is for us to deal with it sometimes because life gets really hard, he does control those circumstances. He cares for you in the midst of those circumstances. And you see that, that hard ground that there is to walk over and the shepherd's calling you that way. Well, he's leading you around that ravine that you would have fallen into had he not called you down that hard path. Do you believe when he says that he will work all things for your good and for his glory in Romans 8? Do you believe that what he says is true? Or is God lying to you? Those are the two options. Either hard things are there to grow us into Christ-likeness, and he cares for us through those, and he leads us through those, or he's a liar, and he's cruel, and he brings you into hard, well, there's a third option that's worse. He's a liar, and he's cruel, and he does it just to punish you, or the third option is, is that we're like the world, and we say that there's no purpose, and there's no control, and we're in hardship just because it happened that way. You know, I, I counsel people often, and I can't imagine facing life circumstances outside of a high view of the sovereignty of God. Because the world will say that stuff just happens, or the universe is mad at me, or there's bad karma, or something. The Bible tells us that from times past, the things not yet, not yet accomplished, my counsel will stand, and I will accomplish all of my purpose in Isaiah 46. He's there with you. He's there for you. In the midst of that hardship, he will bring you through for your good and for his glory. And sometimes we'll get to look back and say, hey, there's a reason I went through this. But sometimes you got to wait till you get to heaven to get that. But he loves you and he cares for you and he calls out all of his sheep and you won't be left behind. He doesn't lose any of his sheep. They're all there. He maintains you. And he's the one over all things. There's great joy in that maintaining. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for this picture, Lord, that you're starting for us here at the beginning of John 10. 
Lord, we know that there are thieves and robbers out there. There are those that try to take advantage and to hurt, to break in and to steal, to cause damage, to raise up insurrection, to bring nothing but hurt and pain. Lord, but those that are yours, we don't have to fear the thief and the robber, the one that might pull us from you, because the shepherd calls out all that are his. Lord, you lead us, you maintain us, you care for us. You are our good and holy and powerful and righteous God that accomplishes all of your will. We get so focused on the small things, and sometimes these small things look like really big things, and they are really hard. They are really difficult. We do really hurt. There is real physical pain, emotional pain. There is real suffering. There is want. But Lord, in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that hardship, you care for us. You love us. Lord, the thief and the robber, they would, they would steal away for their own selfish ends. But Father, you care for us and you lead us. You bind our wounds. You keep us close to still water. Lord, you lead us to green pastures. You anoint our heads with oil and our cup overflows. In the presence of that lion, of that bear, of that wolf, Lord, you prepare a table for us and you provide for us in abundance. I pray, Lord, that as we go about this week and as we, we look to the, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ ahead, that we, re that we would rejoice that you are our shepherd, that you care for us, Lord, that we'd be faithful to hear from your word, to follow after you, to flee the thief and the robber, that false teacher, Lord, help us to be discerning. In our world today, there's so many voices that are competing and fighting for our attention. There's so many things that would draw us away. But there is one true shepherd, this shepherd of the sheep. Let our lives be spent following him as you maintain us, Father, for the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.